out in this room, whether by cell phone, whether by professional, anything like that, there, it's not allowed. You can take photographs, but no flash photography, please. Um, anything else? The satellite information for today, for those interested, satellite will be Galaxy 17, Transponder 14K, slot A, and the downlink number is 11966.5V. We'll be joined in about five minutes with Florida State. Just as a reminder to the media, there is no media buffet today. There are snacks available all day. There will be a, a media buffet tomorrow before the games. Game times tomorrow have been set. The Florida State Murray State game is slated to start at 6.10 p.m. with the Villanova Purdue game following 30 minutes, about 30 minutes after the conclusion of that game, which makes it about 8.40. Uh, that's all set. There will be a media buffet tomorrow, probably before the first game. I'll be back in about five minutes when the Florida State student-athletes arrive. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost ready to start. A reminder, please, we have our two microphone people, Taylor and Michael. Ready for your questions, please wait till they get to you to ask a question. Please identify yourself and your media affiliation, and we're ready to go.
We are joined by Florida State student athletes. On the, on the outside, far left, Terrence Mann. In the middle, Trent Forrest. And closest to me, Biondu Cavangeli. Florida State advanced yesterday with a 76-69 win over Vermont. And they will play Murray State in tomorrow's first game at 6-10. Questions for the student athletes? Middle on the left, Neil. Uh, Neil Ostrow with the Journal Enquirer. Uh, for Terrence and Trent, I guess, uh, talk about facing John Morant. Have you watched him at all? Did you get a chance to watch yesterday? And what kind of challenge does that uh, represent? We'll start with Terrence and then move on to Trent. Uh, he's a good player. We're just going to have to try and contain him as best we can. Uh, he's a good passer also. He likes to find his teammates. So we just try to get in the way of that, um, stick to our principles, and things should fall in place. Mm, yeah, kind of what Terrence said, just try to disrupt them as much as you can. I mean, it's kind of hard to stop a player who likes to pass and get the ball to his teammates because you never know kind of when he's going to attack or when he's going to pass. So I would say just try to disrupt his rhythm would probably be the biggest thing for us. Just a reminder, the Florida State locker room is open at the moment. Another question for the student athletes. Back to Neil. Um, you guys obviously have a, for all three, I guess, you guys obviously have a, a big size advantage, but that's not uncommon. You're larger than a lot of teams on the wings and especially in the middle. Uh, how do you best take advantage of that? Obviously, you'd love to dominate the glass. I mean, they're, they're small, but not maybe as small as some teams you've played. Why don't we start this one with Fiondu and work we'll the other way? Um, we recognize that our size is going to be a good advantage. It's important that we stay consistent through the whole first half. We know that the bigs going to be very energized. You know, we guys got to keep chipping away and just wear them down with our length and our depth and continue to be aggressive on the glass, just wear them down. And with our guards being as disruptive as possible, getting on transition, I feel like we'll uh, chip away and we'll, we'll be victorious. Go, Trent. Go, take that. Um, yeah, just, I mean, try our best to use that to our advantage as we did that pretty much all season, just with smaller teams, just like Fee said, just chip away at it the whole game, just stick to our game plan. And, I mean, make them see bodies, make them go around our length and size. So I feel like we just need to use that to our advantage. Yeah, I agree. Just uh, being consistent, I think, with our length and athleticism throughout the whole game, uh, and especially sticking to our defensive principles uh, to try to disrupt them. Questions for the student athletes? Right down here in the front. You guys obviously faced. Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, Brian Franey with ESPN. You guys obviously faced Zion this year too, and that was a huge challenge. What do you compare this challenge with Morant like to facing him? Or is that both? Um, yes. I mean, I would say they're both, you know, great players and what they do. Um, Zion's very athletic. John Morant's very athletic. Um, but I mean, we've been facing athletic players all year, um, especially throughout the ACC. Um, but as you know, those guys are different. So we just got to come. Our coaches have a game, great game plan for us, uh, you know, to try and stay in front of them and contain them. And I think we'll just do a good job of that. Right there in the back. For for any of the players, I know uh, your teammate had a, a a tragic loss yesterday. I'm wondering how he's doing and how you guys are helping Phil sort of get through a, a tough time. Take that, Trent. Um, I mean, it's hard any time when you lose a parent. So, I mean, he's been doing pretty good. I mean, we've all been there for him since it happened. And, I mean, we're just helping him get through it, giving him his space, his time that he needs, and just be there for him when he, when he needs it. Any other thoughts, guys? Or sums it up. More questions for the student athletes? Yes, go ahead. Throw one more at you on Ja because he's been, you know, obviously such a big story. Uh, you, I'm sure you watch tape. Can you sort of appreciate his game yesterday? I mean, in other words, do you like sort of watch, like sit back and say, yeah, well, this is kind of fun. Like he had an interesting, or is it too much like, man, we got to deal with this guy? So can you sort of step back from a fan's almost point of view and appreciate his game uh, for, you know, said the, the sort of spectacular plays that he makes? Um, I mean, yeah, he had a triple double, and that doesn't happen often in college basketball. So, uh, you, I mean, you could appreciate the triple double that he had. 
um, but also facing him next uh, also is in your head trying to figure out, you know, how you're going to cut that down and not let him have the game type of game that he had yesterday. But like I said, you know, we're just going to use our athleticism, be lengthy, be smart on the defensive end, and try to disrupt it. Trent, you got any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, what he's kind of been doing all season as a fan, I mean, you really all you can do is respect it, honestly. Like Terrence said, it doesn't happen often when you see triple doubles in college. So, I mean, I feel like from a fan's perspective, you definitely have to respect what he's done all season. And um, just going into tomorrow, we just have to be locked in, and it's going to be tough stopping him because he's such a good player. Any other questions for the student athletes? <laughs> right down here in, in the middle. Um, Ed Marlo, Paducah Sun. Um, I'm just curious, obviously a lot of questions about Ja, but what do you guys think you guys bring to the table uh, in a game uh, like this, knowing that the Sweet 16 is right in front of you? Yeah, Andy, you want to start? Uh, um, I think with our team, obviously our quality of our depth, our, our length, but more especially our intelligence. I feel like we're one of the smarter teams in this conference. I feel like that goes underrated, and I feel like our decision making and our game plan preparation is very excellent. Our coaching staff does a great job. Players do a great job adjustment, especially in the Vermont game. It was tied, and you know we were able to regroup and see what we could have made mistakes in and what we could improve on. And the way we adjusted that second half, I just give credit to our mindset and our intelligence. So I feel like with this team. Our overall mental preparation and our game intelligence, our basketball IQ, it was something that we bring to the table. Brent, you want to take that too? Um, can you? I mean, what was the question? What do, what do we bring to the table? Oh yeah, um, definitely our athleticism, our length, our size. So I would say that definitely. And another thing, of going along kind of with the IQ is our experience. I mean. I feel like from top to bottom, we have a lot of guys that's been here. We we understand what's at stake. We understand how to win these tough games. Um, I mean, yesterday it seemed like they had a pretty good crowd. So just being able to kind of manage the crowd, manage the emotions of the game, just for a whole 40 minutes, that experience, I feel like is going to be an advantage for us as well. Any other questions for student athletes? All set? Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. You'll be back in the locker room. Uh, good luck. Coach Hamilton will be here at 155.
folks. We are joined by Florida State coach Leonard Hamilton. Welcome, coach. Congratulations. Once again, the Florida State locker room will be open for coach's duration up here on the podium still. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait till the microphone gets to you. Questions for Coach Hamilton? We'll start right there in the back. Uh, Coach over here, Mark Tracy from the New York Times. Uh, in watching tape on, on Murray State and uh, in particular on Ja, uh, what do you notice uh, different even than if you've, had you have a chance to see any of them play last year and do you notice big differences in the team and in Ja? What I notice is that um, that he's one of the most exceptional players that I've had a chance to to watch play. He's kind of a throwback to a guys who have the ability to score points, but also has the passion and the excitement about creating opportunities for his teammates. <clears throat> guys like uh, Nate Archibald, who can lead the NBA in scoring and also lead him in assists at the same time. A, a guy like Magic Johnson, who got so much joy for making the game easy for his teammates. Even a kid like, a player like Muggsy Bowles, a guy who not only is capable of going out and scoring points, but he has that uncanny way <clears throat> of making the game easy <clears throat> for his opponents. And uh, my opinion is that you have to be careful <clears throat> because he's not winning the games by himself. Uh, he surrounds himself with good players who feed off of who he is and what he is by as a player and you uh, you and I, I'm, I'm excited just for him and for uh, their team because I enjoy watching guys play with such an unselfish spirit and they actually get excited about it and you can just see the the gleam and the joy in his eye it, it motivates him uh, like some some guys they, they play harder and with more intensity when they make shots uh, whenever he completes a pass and makes an assist you can just see him glowing. And that's an a unusual player, and you don't get a chance to play against people like that. Um, and I, I got a tremendous amount of respect for him. But still, at the end of the day, <clears throat> it's going to be Florida State against Murray State. It's not going to be uh, one particular player against uh, a player who probably uh, is going to be very difficult to keep from doing what he does best because he's such a highly skilled physical skilled and mentally and emotionally uh, savvy youngster. Uh, so we pretty much going to be who we are. And I think the team that's going to be successful is going to be the team that comes as close as they can to playing up to their potential. Uh, we have a defensive scheme and have an offensive scheme. They have offensive schemes, they have defensive schemes. Uh, I'm sure they go, they plan to try to minimize ours and play to their strengths and we plan to do the same thing. I think the team that's going to be successful. The teams that uh, come as close to being who they are to the best of their abilities. I hope that answers your question. We'll go to Dom next. Go to Nicole, right here in the middle. Nicole Auerbach, The Athletic. Um, Leonard, what was it like to find out about Phil's father and then how, how do you as his coach approach that and be with him and support him? Just I imagine it was a very incredibly difficult night. Of course it was. Um, uh, Mike Kofer, Phil's father, was one of the most competitive human beings that has ever played in the NFL. Uh, high, a tremendous amount of character, loved and respected by everyone, not only the guys who have played with him, teammates, but anybody who's ever been around him after his playing career was over. Um, uh, he is a guy who had to endure a unbelievably challenging, uh, debilitating disease that uh, mentally, emotionally is draining within itself, but physically the toll that it took on his body uh, is beyond anything that you probably could explain. And he never complained. He always faced it every day with the heart of a lion, with tremendous amount of courage, 
and he passed that same mental and emotional aspect over to his son, Phil. Uh, he, he, he always challenged Phil and he always uh, encouraged him to, uh, to play with the heart of a lion and, 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 and without making any excuses for anything at all. And Phil's attitude has been as good as anyone that I've ever coached in my whole coaching career. He's always positive, he's always energetic, he's a fun guy to be around, a great teammate. Uh, he's a guy that uplifted other guys on the team um, when uh, he had, uh, when they were down. Uh, and he's had to deal with a lot of injuries himself during his coaching career. Yeah, it was very difficult for him and for his teammates and we spent a lot of time last night dealing with it in our own way. Uh, our, the whole, uh, our heart goes out to the Kofa family. Uh, they have uh, been uh, uh, unbelievable Semi Seminoles. Uh, we'll be there for Phil in every, in every way possible. Uh, we have a culture of our basketball team I think is healthy and uh, we're going to do everything we can to, to minimize that the effect. But uh, you, you don't ever really know uh, how challenging going through that experience would be on the, on the individual. But because of our culture and the love these guys have for each other, uh, they feel the same level of pain, but they also have the same love and compassion and care for him that, that they gonna do everything they can. He's gonna know that his brothers are, are there with him. And uh, prior to uh, the news that he got yesterday, we'd already dedicated the season and our play uh, to his father. And, uh, that meant a lot to Phil. So um, it, it's challenging, it's never easy, uh, but um, we, we're prepared to, and I think we've started doing everything we possibly could to, to let him know that he has a, his basketball families with him and we can't do anything but pray for him and his family that they can do it as tragedy, tragedy the best they can. Ralph from the back. Ralph, Ru Ralph Russo, AP. Uh, Leonard, just one quick follow-up. Phil's status, is he going to try to play? Is he going to remain with the team? <coughs> do you know, is that is that clar clarified at this point? Well, he's going to he's going to re remain with the team. Um, we've had several conversations with his family. And they they want him to remain with the team, and he wants to be remain with his team. And then we'll we'll make whatever adjustments we have to from there. Uh, but he'll be with us uh, doing the game tomorrow, and, and then we'll 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 make the decisions that are. Um, necessary as we move forward. Other questions for Coach Hamilton? Right down here in the middle. Then we'll go over to the... Uh, Coach Ed Marlowe from the Paducah Sun. Um, uh, I know it's been a little while, but your ties to UT Martin and to Austin P uh, as an assistant, uh, some people might not know Murray State, but you, <laughs> on the, you on the other hand <laughs> might have a little bit of experience from way back when. Any relation to that at all? And does this bring up fond memories from your yonder years? Well, w when I was um, a student at Austin Peay State, I'm sorry, a student at the University of Tennessee at Martin, <clears throat> a couple of guys on the team with me played, came from Paducah Junior College. Uh, Rick Leeper, I think one of the guys, uh, is still was a friend of mine. Uh, I think we might have scrimmaged uh, them. Uh, and, and whether you know it or not, Cal Luther, I believe, was the Assistant was the head coach at Tennessee Martin. But as moving on to Austin P, uh, back in those days, we had some tremendous uh, battles. If you go back and read uh, the newspapers, you can see that with the team that Coach Luther had there and the team we had at Austin P, they were always packed houses and they were very, very exciting games. And if I remember correctly, Murray State probably had been the team to beat in the, ACC, in, in the conference until we got to uh, Oka, uh, Austin P, and um, we um, we had some tremendous, tremendous, uh, exciting games against them. The two years, three years I was at Austin P. Um, 
Uh, I got a lot of fond memories of of the challenges and the atmosphere that, that exist. Um, Hector Blondell and some of the guys that played at Murray State back in, I think I had a, two or three guys from New York, and we had a guy on our team from New York named Fly Williams that led the average 27 points and nine rebounds a game and as a freshman in a game that we had to win to win the conference. Uh, I think he scored 36 points or something like that. And it was an exciting era for me, and it was a great way for me to start my coaching career. Coach, uh, Brian Franey with ESPN. I guess without giving away any secrets, have you thought how you guys are going to defend Morant and who might guard him tomorrow? I, I addressed that earlier. <clears throat> Florida State's defensive system will be playing against Murray State's offensive system. Um, now, you can spend all your time trying to figure out, stop somebody who might be unstoppable. Um, and, and you can end up not worrying about Murray State and give all your attention to <laughs> the one particular player. He's outstanding. Uh, he's, he's fun to watch unless you're coaching against him. Um, we're not going to change very much for, for who we are. Uh, we can't in one day turn around all of a sudden event a whole new defensive system. Uh, hopefully we play against a lot of outstanding players and schemes in the ACC. Hopefully that has prepared us to play against another outstanding player. And that he's definitely one of the best players in the country. Um, we, we, we will make necessary adjustments out of who we are and the scheme, the system that we've used all along to be where we are now. Uh, we know it's a tremendous challenge when you're playing against a very special talent like him. But we can't lose sight of the fact, though, it's Florida State against Murray State, not necessarily one or two guys against a, a great player like Moran is. Other questions for Coach Hamilton? Yes, right in the back. Coach, it, it, this is related to Morant, but not necessarily about him. It, it seems like nowadays with the one and dones, we almost expect these guys to sort of like be stars immediately. Like these, the, so many great players like a Zion come in and we're already thinking like, oh, that's going to be a number one pick. Uh, do, do we maybe underrate how much development there is in, in college basketball and how much guys can improve that there, there's a lot of room between the guys who are like sort of ready-made stars and guys who can become stars? Well, I think what, what we have done <coughs> in the sport of basketball we created a, um, I think, an unrealistic um, mindset. In the NBA, you got 400 some players. You got 150 of them come from probably Europe. Every year, you only have <clears throat> maybe 20 college basketball players matriculate into the NBA, maybe 20, maybe 25. But that's all we talk about is one and done. It's like they're everywhere. That doesn't exist. There's a lot of development that's needed. Uh, I think we have an opportunity for those elite players, uh, maybe 20, maybe 25, that have an opportunity to go to the next level. And you have about 7,000 kids playing basketball. And all we talk about is one and done. And this cliche that we put that, that we have created a mindset that that's available for any and everybody. Uh, I think it's good that this kid's been in school for a couple of years. He's had a chance to hone his skills and obviously he's prepared, but that doesn't, that's not, that, that's not easy. And you, know, you talk about him, you talk about Zion and probably two or three other players on Duke's team. <laughs> <laughs> that we had to play against. Uh, and I think that having an opportunity for youngsters to be able to realize their dream and move on, uh, but I think the one and done phrase is overused because it's just not that many. And, but we act like that they, they, they're growing on trees and dropping off like apples, that's not the case. Uh, they, these guys are elite guys and they come along few and far between. And then a lot of them that are are drafted in the first round, even though they won and done, they're in the D League uh, by, by January. So this is something I think you guys need to be careful about. This, this is not 
is easy, but he's one of those special elite guys that is obvious uh, that uh, uh, he, he has a that it factor that you can't really put your finger on that makes him special. And um, But I do think that even um, as talented as he is, having the opportunity for a couple of years to develop, and I think when he moves to the next level, he still is going to have a lot to learn, a lot to grow. Those guys who are able to, to move in and, 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 and be uh, major contributors um, as, 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 as first-year players are not as – prominent is sometimes I think we, we, we make it out to make the believe that this is what's going on in, in the basketball world. Any other questions? Anybody else? Any other questions for Coach Hamilton? Thank you very much. Thank you, Coach. Good luck tomorrow. We'll resume at 2.20 with the Murray State student athletes.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to be joined by Murray State players, Shaq Buchanan and John Morant. Murray State advanced yesterday with an 83-64 victory over Marquette. They will play Florida State in the next round. That game will be at 6-10 tomorrow night. Once again, please, no flash photography and no videos. Hi, gentlemen. Good to see you. The Murray State locker room is now open for the next 40 minutes or so. The duration of the players and Coach McMahon's uh, podium visit. We'll start for the. We'll start with questions for the student athletes. Down here in front. Uh, Neil Ostrout, Journal Inquirer. For both guys, uh, what kind of challenges does it uh, bring playing such a big team? Obviously, they start 7 4, 6 9, and their best player might be 6 10 off the bench. Have you seen teams that big, and what kind of challenges are that? Shaq, why don't you take that first, then we'll move to John. Uh, it gonna be tough. It'll be tough. Uh, we haven't matched up with a team with that uh, type of size uh, all year. We just seen some bigs um, though played against athletic teams. Uh, so we practice on things like that. But uh, I don't think it gonna bother us. Uh, we ready for the challenge. Yeah. My, they are very um, long and athletic team. Um, like he said, we haven't seen a team um, like that before since I think Alabama. But um, we just gonna go into the game the same way we've been going into every game. Just try to play our game and um, just do what we do. Questions, Adam. Adam Betts with the Journal Inquirer. This is for both of you. Uh, obviously, Ja had a great game yesterday, but the team as a whole played tremendous. I think you had 30 field goals and 23 assists. What do you need to do to keep that up uh, tomorrow night against Florida State? Jack? Uh, we have a um, solid team. Uh, we know Ja uh, get all the attention. Uh, we uh, like. It's amazing, but we at the same time we know um, how to handle that, uh, and we know everybody gonna be keyed in on him tomorrow. So we just gonna make plays for him like we did against uh, Marquette. Yeah, I say um, we just have a very talented group. Um, we have a lot of people who can score the basketball, and we're very unselfish. Like you said, we had 23 assists um, yesterday. Um, it's just how we play the game. Just try to. Um, instead of taking a good shot and get a great shot. So um, really just try to go out and um, make the best of every possession. Over here on the right. Thanks. Ralph Russo, AP for Ja. Uh, I guess I'm wondering what your off season was like. You made such a big jump this season from very good freshman to, you know, just all America sophomore. What were you working on? What was what was your process like this off season to make this big improvement? I really just worked on the same things I've been working on uh, most of my life, really the fundamentals. Um, but I say I keyed in more on just shooting uh, more game shots this year, coming off ball screens and, and such, and um, felt like I got way better at it. More questions for the student athletes? Jack Wright. Kenny Roth, Murray State Radio Network. Talk a little bit about the uh, the culture at Murray State that attracted each of you to uh, to want to to come play basketball and go to school at Murray State. Jack, uh, we knew about the winning tradition, uh, getting to the tournament, uh, producing pros, uh, and then the fan base, uh, the family atmosphere. Uh, that what I was looking for coming into the. Uh, uh, the, my next school, me coming from JUCO, and Murray State brought me in, and I saw all those things, uh, and that's why I chose Murray State. Yeah. Um, Murray State is just a, uh, it just has a great program, and um, really, I say what brought me in was the family thing. I'm a big family person, and since day one, they made me family, and they just made it. Um, I guess their job just to get me to come here, and I felt like um, I made a great decision. Other questions for the student athletes? Up, down here in front. Uh, Brian Franey with ESPN. Uh, for both you guys, can you just talk about what the whole deal is with the wrestling belts in the locker room? Uh, I code Mac. Um, he a huge wrestling fan, and 
when our manager brought a uh, wrestling belt last year to our first uh, OVC game, and we just used it like our trophy, our motivation. And this year we added two more, so it's just something to look forward to. After a big win, we get to celebrate with the uh, wrestling belts. Um, like you said, um, Coach Matt is a big um, wrestling fan, and um, – we just kept it going since last year and this year. Obviously, we won the regular season championship, yeah. um, won the OVC championship, and now we're looking forward to um, winning a national championship, and that's the three um, WWE belts. Kenny Roth, Murray State Radio Network. Uh, talk a little bit about each of you, the, uh, the process that is so important to the Murray State basketball program. and. Uh, as Coach McMahon alludes to, the uh, getting ready for the next big thing that's there. How do you apply that to, to what you're doing now and preparing for Florida State? Uh, it fit in well uh, with this tournament right now because we play Thursday. More like our come, we play Thursday, Saturday. So it's uh, we're going through it the same way we would if it was in a conference. Uh, play that Thursday, celebrate that Thursday, and move on after that uh, Friday like today and get prepared for Saturday? Um, like he said, it's something we're used to, um, being playing on Thursday, Saturday. So um, we just take every game, go into every game the same way. And we've been doing this really um, most of this second half of the season, I'm playing Thursday, um, recovering Friday, focus on the team we got coming up Saturday, focus on them before the game, and then go out and just fight, try to get a win. Any more questions for the student athletes in the middle, right here? Um, Ed Marlowe, Paducah Sun. Um, guys against Florida State tomorrow, what do you feel like will be the biggest challenge um, that you'll have to earmark going into the matchup? Josh, why don't you take that first? <laughs> well, I'll just say their length. Um, like I said before, they're a very long and athletic team. Um, get after the ball some. So really, I think our focus is just being taking care of the ball. Um, on the defensive end, we try to play the same, um, just focus on trying to uh, force team to take tough shots, don't give them any um, easy looks. And um, I think really just taking care of the ball is be our, our main focus. Jack? Uh, like he was saying, taking care of the ball, uh, forcing that back like a terrible shot and limiting the one shot and make sure we rebound. We know they're uh, taller, tougher. They are, they're going to be a tough game, so we know we're going to uh, have to box out. More questions for student athletes? Nobody, all set? Okay, then we'll excuse gentlemen. They'll be back in the locker room. The racers locker room will be open for another 25 minutes or so. Thank you very much. We'll be back with Coach McMahon in about 10 minutes.
Folks, we're now joined by Murray State coach Matt McMahon. He'll be with us till about three o'clock. The racers locker room is still open for those who want to go there. Welcome, Coach. Good Thanks to see so you. much. Appreciate it. Questions for Coach McMahon? Right in the middle. Hi, Coach. Mark Tracy, New York Times. Um, the story about uh, Jaws high school recruitment uh, has been oft told. Uh, I wanted to ask slightly differently, uh, going from his freshman to sophomore year, so over this last summer, did he take a leap, or was it more he's just, due to the design of your team, able to showcase it more? And if, and if he did take a leap, when... When did that happen and how? Well, I think he did take a leap, but I do think uh, he did not receive enough credit for the terrific freshman year that he did have. I think we talked yesterday, his numbers of almost 13 points, seven rebounds, six and a half assists a game, only been accomplished by eight other players in the last 25 years of college basketball. So I thought there were plenty of signs for what was in store uh, last year as a freshman. But it's a great credit to him and the work he put in in the offseason. Uh, you see the growth in his game. But what uh, I'm really most proud of, I think he's really grown and developed as a leader and is, has done a, an outstanding job uh, of being a great voice and leader of our team. Other questions? Down here in the left corner. Adam Bass with the Journal Inquirer. Coach, I asked your players, um, ja, uh, ja obviously had a great performance yesterday, but the team as a whole did as well. 23 assists on 30 field goals. What do you need to do to keep that up against Florida State tomorrow night? Well, I think you, when you talk about Florida State, there are a lot of things that jump out. The first to me is they're one of the elite defensive teams in all of college basketball. Tremendous physicality, uh, great size at every position, make it really difficult on you to score around the basket. They turn teams over. Uh, we will certainly have to execute extremely well uh, to be able to score against such a dominant defense. Right down here, up front. Coach, uh, Ed Marlowe, the Paducah Sun. Um, you guys play Thursday, Saturday since January, and you've talked a lot about that rhythm this year, about the execution and the way that the week has played out. Uh, is that something that you feel like maybe is a boon for your team going into Saturday, knowing that you've got the Thursday, Saturday bounce back? I don't think so. I mean, we've been able to stay in this routine going on 11 weeks now and have kept things pretty similar. You know, last week we, we scrimmaged on Saturday during the long layoff to try and keep our guys in the same routine. But our guys know we have to just turn the page now and start to really focus in on finding ways to beat Florida State tomorrow. Nicole Auerbach, The Athletic. Matt, um, I'm wondering if you can just kind of reflect on your coaching trajectory a little bit and um, just what it meant to, to get this opportunity at Murray State, a place you knew the culture and the, and the program and the basketball excellence um, and, and kind of how you go about sustaining that. Well, I'm, I'm always forever, forever grateful to Alan Ward, our former director of athletics, and Dr. Davies, our former president, who believed in me and gave me an opportunity. And as we built the program, we had to basically start over uh, with our roster and the culture in the locker room. And it was, it was not easy. And they were right there, extremely supportive, uh, and really helped me along the way uh, to get to this point. And then I think for us, what was really critical was this signing class when we were able to add Ja Morant, Tevin Brown, Shaq Buchanan, and then that spring, Anthony Smith. You're talking about four just relentless competitors, very unselfish players who are all about winning. And I think their two-year record really reflects that. 54 and 10 now, uh, 42 of those wins are by double figures. Uh, they've really made it a dominant two-year run for our program. Nicole? Uh, well, can you just reflect on, so you were in Ruston for like two weeks and then you get the call, like what, what, what's, what that period sure. of time is like? Well, it was an interesting story. I'll try and go through it as quick as I can. But uh, my college coach, Buzz Peterson, uh, was named the head coach at the University of Tennessee. This was back 2001. Uh, I went with him to be a graduate assistant. My roommate was Eric Conkle, uh, who is now the head coach at Louisiana Tech. So we got to be very good friends over the years. 
Uh, he's a rising star in the business. And we always talked about if one of us got an opportunity to be a head coach, the other one joining as an assistant. And so I got the opportunity to do that. Went to Ruston. I was there two weeks. And luckily for me, my family, we never moved. Uh, we never packed up a single box. Uh, we didn't buy a car. Uh, we didn't buy a house. Uh, and then out of the blue, uh, Coach Prohm got the job at Iowa State, and I was fortunate to get the opportunity to come back and interview for the job at Murray. Go ahead, James. Uh, so some of the players were talking about how high energy you are and how you're kind of bouncing off the walls even at 8 a.m. Is this like, are you a coffee person? Is this like natural energy? Where does this come from? No, th there's, a, there's a drink that, that we do uh, enjoy. I mean, it's all legal, uh, <laughs> but I'm not a coffee person. Uh, but no, I, I think I, I love what I do. I mean, we're, we're coaching college basketball. Uh, we get to make an impact on young people's lives, hopefully help them be in a position when they leave Murray State to have great success, not only as basketball players, but as men, as fathers, husbands. Uh, and those things are very important to me. So I say it all the time. I, I wear shorts and T-shirts to work every day. I, I really have it made. So uh, just very passionate and fortunate to get to do what we do. Right over here. Uh, Catlin Bogard, OVC Ball. You, you go back in that locker room right now, everyone seems very relaxed. Um, you know, how is it to have guys that can go from being loose and relaxed to you know, knowing when it's time to focus. And it seems like that's something that these guys have been good at all year. I, I think it's really important. And these guys have been able to strike that, that balance. Uh, I, I think that's one of our biggest strengths, <clears throat> excuse me, is the chemistry of our team. I think we have guys who get along really well. Uh, they're all in, bought into what we're trying to do. They love playing together. Uh, they love winning together. And I talk to them about it all the time. It, it should be fun. I think sometimes that gets lost uh, in the business side of college athletics. I want them to have the absolute time of their lives playing. They've put in the work. Uh, we give them basically Christmas Day off, and they work the other 364 days out of the year. So uh, you only get so many game days. They need to go out and enjoy it and just play and, and have the time of their lives. Here in front. Uh, Coach Ed Marla from The Sun. Um, you talked a little bit about it a few minutes ago, but how do you beat Florida State? And how do you guys execute your game plan uh, tomorrow to perhaps come away with the win? Well, there's a long list of things that, that we'll have to get marked off if we want to have an opportunity to win tomorrow. I touched on their elite defense, so our ability to execute at the offensive end will be critical. Uh, obviously, you see they have great size at every position. Uh, they're relentless to the offensive glass. Can, can we compete with them on the boards, I think, will be important. Uh, how we're able to guard them uh, will be critical. I mean, it's you know this time of year, you're not going to play any bad teams. So we'll have to play very, very well to have an opportunity to win tomorrow. Kenny Roth, Murray State Radio <coughs> Network. Coach, uh, talk a little bit about uh, – John Morant being the latest of the, the Murray State point guards to have success, uh, but, but the, the string of guards that have come through recently and, and why that culture has cultivated the players at Murray State that can go on and have success after college. Well, I, I think during my eight years, uh, I've been very fortunate uh, to recruit. We've been able to recruit some great point guards. I mean, it starts there. And, and then I really believe in our player development program, uh, helping guys get better on and off the court. Uh, but it started for me getting to be an assistant and Coach Isaiah Cannon, Cameron Payne, uh, two terrific players, both NBA draft picks who have uh, over a combined 10 years in the NBA of experience. Uh, and then Jonathan Stark, uh, who's, who was such an elite player for us our two years, is having great success in the G League as part of the Timberwolves organization. I think it says a lot about him. You know, Jonathan averaged 22 points and almost six assists a game as a junior at the point guard position. And after Ja's first day on campus uh, going into his senior year, he came in and said to Coach Nichols, hey, 
Ja's going to start for us from day one. And so we went to the two-point guard attack that year, uh, and it worked out really well for us uh, with the championship and NCAA tournament appearance. And now Ja's the latest, and I think we have a couple, gr couple more great ones on the way. Uh, so I think for me, when, when I talk with our coaching staff, you know, it's about recruiting, scouting, and then the player development program. You know, how much time are you going to invest in our players, in the gym, off the court, building those relationships? I think those are what help players build that trust and keep getting better while they're at Murray State. Other questions? Right down here in front. Mike? Coach, uh, Ed from the Sun. Uh, obviously, Ja and the rest of this team is, has had a, a great trajectory uh, just in the last two and three years. But yourself as a, as a head coach, you're starting to have that trajectory as well. How do you keep yourself uh, grounded in the moment here uh, in Hartford and perhaps keep it going uh, as the head coach at Murray State? I don't worry about trajectories and all that stuff. I just trying to help build the Murray State program as strong as we can, uh, make sure we're investing a lot of time and energy and care in our players, help them get better. Uh, you know, I always try and keep things in perspective. You know, for me, growing up, I always wanted to play in the NCAA tournament. It was always a dream of mine. You know, skip school as a little kid so I could stay home and watch the tournament all day. Uh, wanted to play in it one day. Was fortunate to get that opportunity. And then when you get, you see what a great experience it, it was as a player, I want our guys to get to experience those same things. So uh, that's what it's all about for me, is making sure our players have a great experience while they're at Murray State. And I think if we do things the way we want them done, uh, the culture is built the way we want it, the foundation's in place, uh, the winning and all that will take care of itself. Any other questions for Coach McMahon? Nope. Okay. Then we'll excuse him and go to the locker Thank room. Thank you. Locker. Thanks so Thanks much. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Once again, Murray State and Florida State game time 6-10 tomorrow night with the winner advancing to the West Regional in Anaheim. We'll be back at 3-10 with the student athletes from Villanova.
told us.
Folks, we are about to be joined by the Villanova student athletes. They will be available up here till about 3.30, and then we'll be joined by Coach Jay Wright. We are joined by Villanova student athletes, Phil Booth, Jermaine Samuels. Villanova advanced yesterday with a 61-57 win over St. Mary's. They will play Purdue tomorrow night in tomorrow night's second game of the doubleheader starting approximately 840. We'll open up for questions for our student athletes. The Villanova locker room will be open for the next 30 minutes. Right down here. Rebecca Schneider with the Purdue Exponent. Um, you guys are going up against Matt Harms, who's seven foot three. How often do you guys play um, guys who are over seven feet, and what kind of mismatch does that prevent for you, present for you guys? We'll start with uh, Phil. Why don't you take that first? Uh, we play a lot of guys like that, kind of. I mean, last game we played against um, Hunter from St. Mary's, about six ten, six eleven. Uh, in the championship game, we played against uh, in Seton Hall, uh, Romero Girls, about seven two. Uh, we played a lot of guys over seven feet in Michigan early in the year, seven one. So uh, we still as a team learning how to how to deal with guys with that much height. You know, Harms brings a lot of skill too as well. A very fundamentally sound uh, big man, so he'll he'll present some challenges. Jermaine, you want to take that? Uh, yeah, um, going off what of, uh, Booth said, you know, um, he's a really really big guy, um, and you know, we'll we'll discuss on as as a team how to you know deal with that and uh, execute on the defensive end. Any questions over here? Adam Betts with the Journal Inquirer. My question is for Jermaine. You had a lot of big buckets down the stretch yesterday. What do you need to do to start off the game hot and continue that momentum tomorrow night? Uh, I would just say, um, you know, just staying confident, staying ready. You know, um, my teammates and my coaches are always going to, you know, find ways to put me in positions to score and make plays. And uh, as long as I look to score and, you know, be aggressive, uh, the rest should take care of itself. Yeah, Greg Mengelt, CNHI Sports Indiana. Um, Phil, um, what is it that you've seen from Purdue that, that would concern you, especially on the defensive end? Um, they do a lot of great things offensively. Uh, so many shooters. I mean, of course, Edwards averaging over 20 a game. Um, he can really take over a game. Uh, they have, between Klein and Eifert, uh, great shooters. And then inside, they have Harms. And uh, they have a guy like um, number 20. I can't remember his name. 20. 20. Uh, Eastern. Eastern. Eastern, Eastern, who can do it all, uh, who can handles the ball, finishes, does a lot of good things for him, passes the ball very well. So they have a lot of different guys that can beat you. Right down here in the middle. Uh, thanks. Bob Ford, Philadelphia Inquirer. Phil, uh, you mentioned Carson Edwards. He's, he's such a high-volume shooter and high-volume scorer, and you've seen a lot of those guys. And without giving away your game plan, which I don't expect you to do, I mean, how do you guys like to contend with a guy who 
has that possibility of like going off and changing a game all by himself. Those, t- those type of guys are very dangerous, you know, between, you know, Marcus Howard this season, uh, Miles Powell, and uh, now Carson Edwards. Those guys can really take over a game and dominate, go for 30 or 40 if you um, let them get in the rhythm. So, you know, just try and make everything difficult on them, no easy shots. But uh, he's, he's the type of guy that can get going no matter what the defense is giving him. Other questions for the student athletes? Anybody? No? No other questions for the student athletes? <laughs> okay, then we will excuse them, let them go back to the locker room. It's on one on one. Thank you, guys. Thank Good you. Good luck tomorrow. Appreciate it. We'll be back with Coach Wright in about 15 minutes.
folks. We're about to be joined by Villanova coach Jay Wright. He will be available for the next 20 minutes or so. Villanova's locker room remains open until Coach Wright leaves the podium. When, when Jay leaves the podium, that's, it's been open for a half hour. That's the end of it. Jay? <laughs> Once again, Villanova will play Purdue in tomorrow night's second game, starting about 8.40. Okay, questions please for Villanova head coach Jay Wright. We'll start down here in the front here. Jay, Matt Painter has talked a lot about how getting old and staying old has been a big part of their success. Just curious how you feel like that's played into what you've been able to do at Villanova. Yeah, definitely, definitely important to us. Um, and, and it's something that we've really tried to work on and um, with, with our recruiting and our, our roster structuring. And we got caught this year. You know, we, we expected to have um, Dante DiVincenzo and Omari Spellman back. Um, but for all good reasons, they it worked out great for them. So we're willing to take that hit. And it probably will affect us more even next year than it will this year um, because we won't have any seniors next year. Um, thank God for Phil Booth and Eric Pasco. They've had a lot of responsibility. And, and the old guys still carry this team. Any questions? Right over there? Back front? Yeah. Jay, Charlie Clifford, Wish TV. Matt Painter lost four seniors last year, probably one of his top classes. What can you say about the job he's done this year to get his team here? Yeah, I, I just saw him in the hallway, and, that, and that's exactly what I said to him. I just said, I'm so happy for you to have a season like this and and impressed, man, it's, it's, it's amazing. It really is. Because like we just talked about, I know in their program, they. You know they rely on guys that understand their system and and that have played in their system and um, and are no proud of being a part of something bigger than themselves. That's what makes them good. And then you lose four of them, right? It takes time to build that again. And I think um, not just what they've been able to do this year, but the way they've been able to improve throughout the entire season to win the Big Ten. They were 16 and four, I believe. Is that right in the Big Ten? That that's impressive any time, any year, but after losing four guys, that's amazing. Adam? Adam Betts with the uh, Journal Choir. Gotcha. Um, are you excited that it's a single session tomorrow so there'll actually be people in the building when you tip <laughs> off? I feel bad about, I feel, I, I feel bad about saying that now. Um, no, everybody in the building's been awesome. These, every, the building's been great. We got great locker rooms. Everyone treats us great. Everything's set up I just meant it was just shocking <laughs> to the players that have not been in an NCAA tournament when you tell them how special it is you know it, I know it was because of TV and the you know in the NCAA but uh, I didn't mean to say anything about bad about the people the building it's not their fault it's, the building's been great we, we, we've been treated extremely well so I am happy to have a crowd there <laughs> we're right here Bailey Chambers from the Purdue Exponent. Jay, um, just your thoughts on what Matt Painter's been able to build uh, over his 15 years at Purdue, the sustained run of success. You know, that, you can look around college basketball. It's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to do in anything is sustained excellence, right? Um, you, you can get hot for a while, and then, and then how do you handle success, right? Or you can be down for a while, and, and how do you handle failure? Well, he, he's handled everything, right? And and every year you just, you know that team is gonna be well coached, disciplined, they're gonna execute, and they're gonna compete for championships every year. It's 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 really impressive. That's, uh, and greatness is is uh, sustained excellence, right? And, that, and that's what he's done. And I'm sure uh, 
Coach Kidd, he's really proud. It's, it's pretty cool. I was watching film and just to see him sitting in the stands at one of their games is, uh, I think that's a big part of it. I think Matt respects um, Purdue's history, respects Coach Katie, that, and that's what makes him so good. You know, it's not about him. It's, it's about the tradition of Purdue basketball. And to be as successful as he is and as good a coach as he is and not make it about him is, I think, probably what's unique about him and Purdue. Yeah. Matt, can we hold it down over there? Trying to work here. <laughs> uh, Jake, uh, Carson Edwards, guy who has such an incredibly high volume of, of takes and, and makes, yeah. and uh, the kind of guy that scares you a little bit because if he goes off, it doesn't matter in some ways what else you're doing. Right. I don't want you to give me your game plan. I asked Booth for it. He wouldn't give it to me either. <laughs> but, I mean, a guy that quick, it's hard to deny. Is, is it then just switch and help and, and just make sure he doesn't have a lot of room to maneuver? How do you, how do you look at a guy like him? Or, you know, you had Marcus Howard this year and all those guys. And but, but similar to those guys, Powell and Howard, where you're not, you're not going to stop him. And, and part of the game is not getting frustrated if he – comes down in transition and pulls up literally from 30 feet and makes a shot that can't break you mentally, you know? And the thing about Purdue more than any team we've played is the other guys are really good too, you know? Um, Klein's, a, a Klein could put up the numbers that Edwards did if Edwards wasn't on the team. And I think, again, that's what makes them a great team that it doesn't bother any of them. And it's obvious the way they play together harms. You know, they can go inside. If Edwards, if they just choose, <laughs> they got choices, you know. Eford shoots the hell out of it, right? And uh, and then, you know, you, you look at um, Eastern, you know, he, that, that kid can do a lot. Like he can post up, he can drive the ball, he can score, he can guard anybody. So we, we can't just try to hold Edwards. He, he could score 25 and maybe you could win because he's just so good. But... Um, that what makes them so difficult is his explosiveness, and then the ability of the guys around them. Pete, uh, Jay, Pete Thamel from Yahoo. Uh, you mentioned sustaining excellence, and obviously you, you've had player turnover. You've also had an enormous amount of staff turnover uh, because of all the winning and your guys going on to get jobs. Just wondering philosophically how you've how you've handled that. It seems like you've almost started a little bit of a feeder system within your program. I'm just wondering if that was intentional or it kind of happened organically. You know what, Pete, that, that is something that uh, we're really proud of this year. And over the last two years, we lost our top two assistants to head coaching positions. Uh, Baker Dunleavy is here in Connecticut at Quinnipiac and Ashley Howard at LaSalle. And so on our staff, you know, from our top assistants to our third assistant, Mike Nori, to our Dobo, Dwayne Anderson, um, everybody's in a new position for the first time. That was one of our struggles about being young this year, too. And those guys have done an incredible job. And, and, and I'm really proud of them. And when you talk about the feeder system, one of the things that we've learned over the years is all, all those guys that are on our staff have either been previously assistants on our staff or have played for us. And um, it's harder to teach our culture than it is to teach the X's and O's of what we do. So we want to keep guys that understand the culture when they come in so it's an easier adjustment to, to whatever we're doing x and o wise and and that's that's been part of our feeder system dom uh, dom amori from the hartford current jay hey, dom. i don't know if you had a chance maybe to, to sneak a peek at murray state yesterday or if you've seen them in person in the past but i just wondering as a basketball guy your take on john and you know what you like about him what's unique about him um, I haven't seen a lot, but the thing that I have, so we could take this with a grain of salt, but I'm a, I love when guys that are that talented that could play to get their, to get outrageous numbers in terms of scoring always makes the right play and always plays to win. That's what's really impressive to me now. I haven't seen a lot, but when you have that much talent and you know you can really get a shot off anytime you want and you could score as much as you want, but you still make the right pass and make the right play to your teammates and you still defend and rebound, 
it, it's that was that's that's always hard to do, but in today's uh, players' mindset is really rare, and it's really impressive. Joe, in the, in the middle. Uh, Joe Giuliano, Philadelphia Inquirer. Jay, um, offensive rebounding last night was a bit of a problem, and, and it seems to have been non-existent. No, right, well, non-existent. <laughs> I'll use your word. Um, but it's been hot and cold, and I just wondered, what do you guys have to reinforce, especially tomorrow night, because Purdue is a they average over 12 offensive rebounds a game. Yeah, there's two sides of that, Joe. As you know, number one is keeping them off the glass. Um, you know, they're even their guards, their guards offensive rebound really well, which is rare. You know, um, so that's what's interesting about the NCAA tournament when you when you go against different styles and you really only have a day to prepare, and that team that you're preparing for is, is they're not just a different style; they're really successful at it, or they wouldn't be here. How we can quickly get our guards to rebound against their guards is going to be important. And then for us to to just do a better job of stealing an extra possession of two, um, we got a couple at the end of the game that were in last night, but we only got a couple. But they were crucial. Um, we just we just have to you know we watch film today and we just got to commit to it and maybe do a, a better job. But they're a great rebounding team. Right there. Greg Mengel, CNHI Sports Indiana. You talked a little bit about uh, Purdue's offense. What do they do defensively that concerns you? Um, very, very disciplined in, in terms of uh, using their size. They've got great size to keep you in front of them, right? But still remain close enough to contest your threes. So, some teams can back off and keep you in front of them, but they, they can't guard the three. And then some teams can get up in you, but you can go by them. And they, they have, again, that's why Matt's a great coach, and they all do it. Um, they just give you just enough space that you can't go by them, but they can still get up and contest you. And then they keep you in front of them. So, you know, to Joe's question, offensive rebounding is difficult when you don't go by anybody. And they're always keeping you between them and the basket. They do a great job of that. Ralph? Hey, Ralph Russo, AP. <clears throat> a question related to Ja. Kid comes in, is a little off the radar, and takes big steps each year. So many of the superstars, like a Zion, um, in the one and done era seem to be sort of ready made superstars. What does it say? Do we underrate sort of the, the development that happens in college basketball? In other words, like guys can actually like take some time to develop into stars? Yeah. We, we do. And, uh, and I, I get it. You know, I, I get that, uh, you know, everybody likes to see the, the phenom and the new guy that just came on the scene and, and he's going to be a great NBA player and it's a no brainer, right? I get that. And, and you have to celebrate that. It's pretty cool. Um, I, I actually feel bad. I've never seen Zion in person, and I, I feel bad. I want to see it, you know. Um, I, it'd be nice in a game because that means we advanced. But, um, but I, I think tr true college basketball fans really desire knowing more about the guys that develop, you know. Um, and, and I wish we would – do more of that and I wish somehow we could figure out in college basketball I don't I do not want to take away anything from those guys that are the stars because they make the game they make people come to the game and watch it on TV but the true college basketball fans I wish there's a way in, in college basketball we could really celebrate those guys there's some there's some awards uh, like the best senior in the country that, that stayed for four years but I don't feel like it's the, the publicity you know, maybe of of the the one and done guy that's that's a great player too, um, and 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 those guys are really valuable to our game, and those guys are valuable in the NBA too. So um, it's 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 something that hey, maybe we can all work on together. Any other questions for Coach Wright? Nobody. Good. Okay, then we'll excuse it. Thank you, guys. Congratulations again, and we'll see you tomorrow night. We will be back with the Purdue student athletes at 3.55.
locker room is open now for five more minutes, and then Purdue's locker room is open at 355.
Guys, you're, everybody, we're about to be joined by the Purdue student athletes, Ryan Klein and Carson Edwards. Purdue advanced yes last night with a 61-48 win over Old Dominion. They will play Villanova. Thank you. They will play Villanova tomorrow night at about 8:40. Welcome to the Purdue student athletes. The Purdue locker room is now open for the next 40 minutes. Questions for our student athletes on the podium. Any questions? Go ahead. Please identify yourself. Ryan Fannin with Villanova Radio. Uh, for both of you guys, if you could just talk a little bit about this stretch of early on in the year, through 11 games, you were six and five, and now I believe you won 18 of your last 22. What's been the biggest difference from that first part of the season until these last couple months from both your perspectives? Start with Ryan. Um, I, you know, I feel like when we were six and five, uh, we, we had a couple games that were really close, and you know, we, we couldn't quite close them out. But um, you, you know, that that 18, 18 out of 22 stretch, you know, we kind of just figured it out. Uh, yeah, I'd say the same thing. Just kind of, I guess, kind of buying in. To, uh, what Coach Painter was telling us and just kind of, I guess I'd like to say focusing in on the defensive end. I felt like it was the small things and the details that we weren't really executing with. So we were able to put that together and was able to string along some wins. Other questions for the Purdue student athletes? Go ahead. If you guys can just talk a little bit about last night, uh, sort of a, a unique situation with Eastern and um, him supposedly, I guess, slipping in the uh, warm-up line and just sort of how you guys got word of that and then one of your elite defenders is not playing the entire first half and then he plays in the second half. Just sort of talk about how, as a group, you guys handle that news and sort of how that played out. If you could just explain a little bit about that dynamic of that story. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think some of us saw it happen. Um, you know, he, he kind of just slipped and fell under the basket. I thought it was just a wet spot, but, you know, he ended up hurting his ankle. Uh, that obviously stinks when, you know, when your key players gets hurt. Um, those non-contact injuries are always pretty scary. But, you know, we, we came in at halftime, and he was running and doing some cutting drills. So uh, we're just happy to have him back for Saturday. Uh, yeah, same thing, just kind of seeing that that incident happened, which I was actually standing right there, just kind of helped him up. And I thought it would be okay, but then once he kind of went to the sideline, I realized it was a little more serious. But then, uh, yeah, Eric Hunter stepped up and just kind of just kind of play on the fly and just kind of, yeah, just got to kind of make changes, just kind of go with what you have. Other questions? Yes, right here. Uh, Dylan Sin from the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. Uh, last night you guys took 30 of your 53 shots for three pointers. Uh, is that something that is a little bit of a concern, or is that kind of where you guys want to be in terms of uh, the balance of threes and twos? Um, in a sense, you know, I, I thought you know that most of those shots were pretty good shots. Uh, some of them did fall, some of them didn't. But uh, that's actually a pretty good stat. I didn't know that. You know, it's it's uh, it's something that. Against Villanova, we need to get the ball in the paint, and then they're pretty good, you know, with with not allowing that. So, um, when we do get those paint touches, good things happen. So, hopefully, we can change that next game. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I didn't even know that, but I guess it kind of just goes with the flow of the game. You have guys around you that can shoot the ball well. Sasha, Ryan, Aaron can shoot at some. Even Matt hit a three, and uh, just being able to have guys around you that can shoot threes, it doesn't seem too alarming to shoot a high amount of threes. But then. Also, at the same time, you kind of want to have a good balance, be able to get in the paint, get the ball inside, and things like that. So, Rebecca Schneider with the Purdue Exponent. Um, they have three guys who are 6'9", and obviously you guys have got harm, some tall guys of your own. How do you guys take advantage of that mismatch situation? Um, you know, we, we kind of got to just play our game. Uh, I feel like we've been moving the ball pretty well, especially last game. So uh, they're pretty good. They're pretty good at guarding the, the first and second action. We got to make them guard the second, third, you know, fourth action to to get what we want. Yeah, just kind of agreeing on what he said. I mean, uh, just kind of, I guess, going with the mismatches. But then also they have strengths of theirs. So we just kind of just got to be ready for tomorrow. Any other questions? 
Speaking of uh, strengths, if each of you all could answer this question, what do you think uh, at this point in the season is probably the two or three biggest strengths of your ball club overall? Um, I'm going to go first. This time. <laughs> um, the biggest strengths, I don't know. I don't like to kind of just talk about what we I think our strengths are as a team because I, I feel like we still have so much to work on as a team, and we're continuing to try to improve even when it's late in the season like this. So, But, I mean, I can tell you what our main focuses are every game. I can tell you that. And I think that's just honestly just make, getting stops, regardless of how we are on the offensive end, just being able to get stops and try to limit them to uh, – the one chance to score the ball is getting a rebound, not giving up second chance opportunities. And then after that, just kind of executing on the offensive end, whether that's a set or a play or even a transition, just getting the best shot possible. Those are the three things we focus on, being patiently aggressive. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, obviously agreeing with what he, what he said. I feel like our strengths kind of vary. You know, every game it kind of changes, but we need to be a little bit more consistent, especially against a, a good team like, like Villanova. Any other questions? you guys are playing the defending champs tomorrow is that does that enter into your mind at all when you're taking the quarter is it more just we're trying to get a win in the tournament um i i guess i wouldn't say it doesn't enter my mind i, I guess it enters my mind just in the in the respect factor you respect them as a team you respect the the history they have and the players they have on the team that are really good players and play well together fundamentally sound and things like that but at the same time you got to go out and try to take it as every game and just value every possession and just try to get a win. I agree. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions for the Purdue student athletes? No? Okay, then we will excuse them, send them back to the locker room, which will be open for another 20 minutes or so. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Coach Painter will be here about 4.15.
Okay, folks, we will wrap up our off-day press conferences. We're joined now by Purdue coach Matt Painter, who will be up here until 4.35. The Purdue locker room remains open until 4.35. Questions for Coach Painter? Right down here, front. Matt, just curious, uh, anything similarities you see between either the program you have or the program you want to have and, and what you see in Villanova from a, a, a culture standpoint? Well, obviously, they've done a very good job of finding their guy and uh, developing those guys um, with, uh, you know, the four guys that we faced a couple years ago um, that are now in the NBA and Pascal and Booth were in the, in the game that we played also. So you can see kind of the evolution of their program you know, from one year to the next, and then how it kind of continues. And they've had some guys leave early, but they've also had older guys. They've had a very good balance. And I think that's what you have to be able to do is have that consistency in recruiting and not have those empty classes, especially in their case where guys will leave um, after they've developed in a short amount of time. Um, you know, that's so key. And that's how you keep winning. That's how you keep winning Big East championships. That's how you keep winning national championships and advancing it is by you know not by having a, a couple good guys is by having you know a handful of really good players that buy into a system so their discipline and their toughness and then obviously their decision making and their skill um you know it, it isn't just like a one-year deal or a one-player deal it's a you know it's a vision it's a group of guys buying into it and uh, sticking together and playing hard Hey, Matt, Bob Ford from the Philadelphia Inquirer. How are you today? Doing good. Good. You guys got a lot of components to your team, but you've got such a volume shooter and scorer in Carson that I'm sure teams do a lot of different things to try to limit him, unless he can obviously get off and change a game for you all. What have teams tried? And as you look at Jay as a man-to-man -man switching defense, do you, how do you expect them to attack Carson? Yeah. Well, I think they do, they're going to make it difficult. You know, they. They always try to, you know, take guys away, whether they're switching ball screens or trapping ball screens or switching other action away from the basketball. They're, they're going to get you out of rhythm. And the one thing with Villanova, no matter who you have on your team, they're still going to do the same things that they do. Like, they might change a little bit, but for the most part, um, they're going to be very physical. Um, they're going to play very hard. Um, they're going to make you beat them in a, in a different way than you're used to. I think that's probably more important for our team to understand is, is when they take something away, you know, you can't stand. You know, you have to keep moving. You have to go to that second, third option, and you can't panic. Um, I think once they get you kind of shooting into a crowd or shooting a little further out than you're used to, you know, they have you where they, you know, where they definitely want you. You know, you still got to be able to get the basketball in the paint. It's no different than what they're trying to do on the offensive end. Like, you know, if you just let Villanova live in the paint, they're going to beat you. You know, you have to do something, and you have to be steady enough on the defensive end, you know, to keep them out of there. Matt, Bailey Chambers from the Purdue Exponent. Uh, just your thoughts on what Jay Wright has been able to, to achieve at Villanova in his time there. Obviously, he couldn't get over the hump for a while, but two times in the last three years, um, he got it done. Yeah. So, well, I, I think you know people that don't win the national championship. I think they do get over the hump. You know, it, it is pretty difficult. You know, you can't just call one team a successful team and the rest of us are failures. Um, I think there's a lot of great coaches out there that don't make the NCAA tournament some years. Um, you know, it's very difficult. It's very competitive. Um, it's a hard thing to do. But no, he's uh, you know, obviously did a great job at his previous stop. Um, and obviously earned the right to, to get the opportunity at Villanova and then has been here a long time. I think that's a hard thing to do is stay someplace um, for a long time. You have to have consistency, you have to have discipline, and you have to continue to learn from your own mistakes. And I think just from reading articles about him and you know, I, you know five, six, seven years ago, they might have got a more talented guy or maybe higher ranked guy, but it wasn't a Villanova guy. And now here they've done a much better job uh, you know, in the past five or six years, getting his type of guy and then, you know, really fitting into their culture. And it's obviously led to a lot of wins and a lot of championships. Right here in the middle. Hi, Matt. John Fanta from Big East Digital. Just to extend further on that, how hard is that to do in this sport with the current yeah. culture of it to get 
four-year players like right. Jalen Brunson, uh, Josh Hart, those types of guys? Yeah. Well, not all those guys were four-year players, even though they stay three years. Um, I think you put them in that mold. But I think the hardest thing to do for him um, is knowing when they're going to leave. You know, if you have a one-and-done guy that's the number one ranked player in the country and everybody knows he's going to leave, you prepare for that. And when it's obvious, the people you're recruiting understand that, and you don't have to argue that fact. But when you have guys that wait in the balance, and after their second year, they might be an end of the first round or second round guy or middle to the second round, they really don't know if they're going to go or not. And with that, most people that sign top 100 type players, you sign them in the fall before you get to that point. So that's a very tough balance to be able to do. You know, you always have to prepare that people are going to leave. And then when they don't leave, you know, these freshmen, they don't want to come in and sit. You know, they want to come in and they want to play right away and they want that opportunity. Um, I think he has a great situation because now he's, you know, won at such a high level and been very consistent. He can show the substance. He can show what coming and maybe playing a role for a year and then developing into one of his stars in year two and three has paid off for those guys that have been successful at Villanova and also been successful professionally. Here in the middle. Matt, can you provide an injury update on Nogel and whether he's going to be a game time decision or he's cleared? Yeah, I, I would think he'd be all right. We're going to go and, um, and and practice a little bit here, not much, but I, but I think he'll be okay. I think it was really good for him to get, um, you know, into the second half and and be able to play a couple minutes for us. But everything looks like it'll be a go. Right here in front, Tom. Uh, Dom Amore from the Hartford Current. Coach, I was wondering if you got any chance to see Murray State yesterday or how much you might have seen of, of John Morant and just as a basketball guy, what you, your take is on him. Right. I, I've just watched him a little bit. I watched a little bit of the game um, yesterday, obviously not live, but he plays in, the, in a league that I used to coach in 20 years ago. Um, so there, there's always been talented players um, in the Ohio Valley Conference. We played Belmont this year and we we're fortunate to beat them. And they're obviously a really good team, uh, well coached. But I think the guy at Murray State, you know, Matt does a good job. Um, it, it's hard sometimes when you get a guy of that magnitude. Um, but it's 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 also kind of easy when they're passers. You know, John Morant passes the basketball. You know, he keeps everybody happy. And when you have the guys that can score 30 points in a game, but also, you know, can get guys open shots, and they have a couple guys that can make shots, and they got a couple good interior guys and you have that balance at that level it, it, that's pretty special because you have a big point but you have size and you have shooters and now that's what high major teams look like high major teams look like that kind of a balance because you're able to go out and get those guys um, but I think John Morant's a you know pretty special player um, when you can affect the game in different ways um, you know it, it's hard to get into a tournament and then really scheme for those guys because he can, he can do it on your own. You overdo some things with you, and those guys are making threes. They're going to be a tough out. Other questions over here on the left? Uh, Adam Betts, the Journal Inquirer. Coach, how cool do you think this week has been for uh, Aaron Wheeler being a Connecticut yeah. kid? And then what are you expecting for him tomorrow? Well, he, um, he did some good things for us yesterday. He got a little bit in foul trouble. He had four fouls. Um, but I, you know, I should have played him more. In our last game in the tournament, you know, he did some good things for us. They had a they had a good front line, a big front line in Minnesota. But he, you know, he offset some things with his ability to stretch the defense, and that's really what we need from him. You know, we need him to stretch the defense and then get out and transition and make some plays. Last night he had a really good play in transition where he got fouled and scored the basket. So um, we feel like Aaron's going to be a really good player. And obviously last year he redshirted. Um, this year, you know, he plays about 10 to 15 minutes a game, and then obviously. Keep you know keep working hard in his progression where he's going to play more for us in the in the future. But uh, um, things work in mysterious ways, and, and so to be able to be from Connecticut and then come to a school in the state of Indiana and then uh, playing your first NCAA tournament back in your home state that's that's pretty cool. It's a little surreal. Any other questions for Coach Painter? Yeah, right here in the middle. John Fanta, Big East Digital. Uh, Matt, what do you think about the versatility of Eric Pascal? Villanova. Oh, you know he's a he's a tough cover. I just got done watching him versus us um, three years ago. He had like 14 points in eight minutes. Um, but we had a, we had a different group. He played like the undersized five form um, in that tape. Then obviously we've watched him a lot through clips and things this year. And so you know not too many guys can 
you know, say they can play the two, three, four, and five and guard those positions. You know, he's one of the few guys, I think he's got a bright future just because of those interchangeable pieces. He can shoot it, he can drive it, he's powerful, he's explosive. Um, I think he'll play in the NBA for a long time. Um, but, you know, you have to be there with him and get him out of rhythm, and then you have to be able to keep him in front of you. And there's not a lot of people that can do that. And so that's going to be, a, you know, I don't think a challenge for any one of our guys. It's going to be a challenge for our team. Um, and just to try to keep him out of rhythm, keep him away from the rim as much as possible, and uh, just not let him get going. So when great players get going, they're tough to stop. Can I ask one more Carson Edwards question? Sure. Okay. When you were in the recruiting process and you, you were looking for a guard, and I know there were some localish guys who you were looking at, Xavier Simpson and uh, right. and the guy that went to Illinois, whose name escapes me. But anyway, so what made you say no? I, we're going to go with this kid from Texas who really likes to fire it up, and you know we're going to live and die with him. And what what about him made you say let's give him the scholarship? Well, it was actually a, uh, the scenario was different. We had a guy commit to us in the fall that D committed to us in the spring. And so then we had to start our recruiting at that time. And so trying to now get back involved with Xavier Simpson, um, start recruiting the kid that ended up going to Illinois, um, that has transferred from Illinois since, and then pick up Carson's recruitment along with about four or five other guys. You know, it's, um, it's something that I don't like to do. Um, everybody says, hey, these four or five guys that are left are good enough to play in the Big Ten. But that doesn't mean they're the right fit for Purdue. You know, I, I want the guys that fit at Purdue and they're productive. And now if there's five or six guys out there you can get involved with, you know, how many of those guys fit your criteria? And then how many of those guys can you get that, you know, that do fit your criteria? So that's, that's a sticky part of recruiting. So um, when we jumped in with him, um, just his ability to make shots is what jumped out to me. Just, you know, I, I just think when you have somebody that can shoot that way and, and put that kind of points on the board, you know, you just got to be able to figure it out. And so we took him kind of as a point combo, um, but just a quality player. And uh, we're very fortunate. You know, we're very fortunate to be able um, to get him, especially the circumstances that I explained. All right, in back. Coach, I asked uh, Carson and Ryan this question as well. Uh, two different questions. First one about the growth of your team from six and five to now 18 and four, your last 22. What has been the biggest areas of growth in your team in this great 22-game stretch you played? What, what did they say? Because <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones that play. They said it was coaching. They, they said it was all coaching? Yes, yes. They said they got a no great question. coach. They're, they're still trying to get more minutes, and they play 34 <laughs> minutes a game. Um, I think it was our ability um, to defend and, and just ultimately play harder. You know. It, the, the thing I talked about after the Notre Dame game was, you know, we all try to find our ways through our scoring. And one of the best things to be able to do as you grow as a player is to get over yourself. And it's really hard to do. Um, as a coach, you've got to get over yourself. Uh, Bill Walsh calls it the disease of me. You know, you win games and you think it's you. But in reality, you know, it's just a small part. If you win games at Purdue and you coach at Purdue, do you have a hand in the success? Yeah, yes, you have the hand in success, but a very, very small part. You know, it's still a player's game. But as a player, if you have that attitude that, you know, this is a team game and we're, you know, in it, and if you score 30 points and you understand that a lot of people helped you score those 30 points, it makes it work. If you score 30 points and you think you're the one that did it all, it just doesn't work that way. But while you're trying to find your way in a game and you play six to 10 minutes a game or 10 to 20 minutes a game, and you're taking your value from that, from the three shots that you get, then you're missing the big picture. You know, you, if you take three good shots and miss them, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you take three bad shots and you go one for three, there's something wrong with all three of those bad shots, even though one went in. You know, you have to take your value and your effort and your attitude and your ability to be productive. Guarding your man, not turning the ball over, executing, those are the things that lead to winning. So I really, you know, just tried to get each guy to understand that. Um, and also just kind of like when you're losing close games, we, we, we lost to Florida State, Texas, uh, Virginia Tech. They all were, you know, they were possession games. Two of them were on the road, one was neutral. Um, we're not that far away. But yet, you know, if everybody can just be one possession better, um, we're going to put ourselves in a lot better position going forward. And uh, that, that was just kind of the message. I know it's a lot of stuff. 
that I tried to get across to each guy. And I thought each guy, you know, in their own little ways, you know, sacrificed and did those things. Um, but I thought the guys coming off our bench really helped. They, re they really helped understanding that their 10 minutes was important. Instead of thinking I played 10 minutes and this stinks, I don't get to play more. Um, because if you keep a good attitude and you keep working hard and you're a freshman, you know, your time's going to come. We have time for one more quick one. That's <coughs> quick. Right down here. Uh, Casey Bartley, Hammer and Rails. St. Mary's deployed two big men occasionally last night against Villanova. Is that something you saw that you think you could work with Harms and Williams? You've used it a few times this right. year. Y yeah, I, I think um, we could possibly do that. Um, but, you know, whoever's playing well, whoever's defending and, and doing a good job, I think who, you know, who we will stay with. I think that's going to be an important piece to this game. You know, what guys do we have who start and what guys do we have coming off the bench? Um, that can match up well with them. You know, that they, they have some, they're very versatile guys, and so it's a tough matchup for us. So if we, if we can do that and still take care of the basketball, yeah, I, I don't see why there's any problem um, of us playing two bigs. But a lot of times we just stick with our rotation and, and with the guys that we have. That's it. With that, we'll excuse Coach Painter. All right, Wish thank you good you. luck tomorrow. Once again, game time about 840. The winner advances to the South Regional in Louisville. Thanks, everybody.